Hi everyone and welcome back to Philosophy of Cognitive Science with me, Dr. Josh Redstone. Today what we're going to be doing is finishing up our look at Chapter 5 from Clark's book, Mindware. Uh, of course, that chapter is all about perception, action, and the brain. Last time we covered the sketches section, and today we'll be covering the discussion section. Now, um, this sketches section has, uh, well, I should say the sketches section of this chapter was a bit longer than the sketches section of the chapters we read up until this point. The discussion section contains more points of discussion than is typical. However, um, these points of discussion are all a little bit shorter. So I know I said this when I wrapped up the last lecture. Uh, I think this one will be a little bit shorter. Um, but as I also said last time, I often think my lectures will be a little shorter and they end up being longer than the ones that I don't think will be short. So we'll try to get through this um, as quickly and as succinctly as we can. So before we dive into things, on slide number two, I've just outlined a little bit of a recap. Uh, last time when we covered the sketches section, we spent a lot of time discussing uh, Mars level, uh, levels of analysis, right? Sometimes this is called the tri-level hypothesis. We talked about the computational level, the algorithmic level, and the implement... Uh, <laughs> we talked about three levels of analysis, the computational level of analysis, which is the highest, most abstract level. This is the level in which we give a computational description uh, of the task that the system we're interested in uh, does. Then we move down to the algorithmic level where we provide an algorithmic account of that task. And finally, we move to the uh, most concrete or most fundamental level, which is the implementational level. And this is where we try to understand how the algorithms uh, that uh, take care of the task we identified at the computational level, how those algorithms we've identified at the algorithmic level of analysis are physically realized or physically implemented. But we also stressed the importance last time of paying attention to the neurophysiological details, not um, you know, taking Mars' uh, approach as license to ignore the implementational details. Basically, let's not repeat the mistake of functionalism, you know, getting too uh, comfortable with purely functional descriptions of minds and ignoring implementational details. Marr himself was quite aware of the importance of paying attention to the implement uh, implementational details because he was a computational neuroscientist. And indeed, he developed these three, uh, you know, these levels of analysis uh, to aid the implementational level work that he was doing by giving computational and algorithmic, uh, basically information processing descriptions of the, um, of the early visual system, which is what he studied. Uh, and Clark is, of course, emphatic about this and also emphatic about paying attention to the uh, mind-body-world interface, not just the mind. So we also examined four propositions um, which suggested the importance of paying attention to how perception and action are really generated and how the brain, as well as the body and the world, all work together to do this, right? And we talked a lot about behavior-based robotics and the subsumption architecture. We also talked about evidence against this kind of, um, this notion of central cognition operating over a detailed inner representation. This is where we talked about change blindness and intentional blindness. So lots of stuff there, some of which I covered in uh, more sparse detail than I did other points. So do refer back to the chapter if you need to, or send me a uh, message on Discord or an email or leave a comment down uh, in the comment section if you're not clear about anything. All right. So that's it for my brief recap. I expect I will recap uh, more details as we proceed today in order to kind of fill in uh, for my lack, of, uh, my lack of detailed slides this time around. Um, but why don't we dive into the discussion section. So we'll pick things up on uh, chapter three and we'll discuss the first point of discussion, which concerns Mars levels and the brain. So one of the things I mentioned during the previous lecture, in part one of this lecture, was the distinction between Mars levels of analysis, uh, the uh, computational, algorithmic, and implementational levels, are not exactly clear-cut. 
I'm not sure if any of the examples or lines of evidence I considered really, um, really illustrated this clearly, though. So that's what this point of discussion is all about. Um, so I've already said that these levels tend to blend into one another, and also that levels of analysis do not necessarily map onto levels of functional organization in, like, actual brains. So I'll try to clarify this uh, as we proceed through these points of discussion. To try and clarify this, let's go back to our running example of vision. Now the task description of vision, as we saw last time, if we were to give a computational level description <clears throat> of vision, of vision uh, would be to transform two-dimensional information, uh, which is, you know, the information that hits the back of the retina uh, in the eyes. The eyes are like a camera, uh, a camera obscura, basically. Um, if you don't know what a, cam a camera obscura is, um, I'll link you to a Wikipedia article. But basically the eye, the human eye anyway, is like a naturally evolved camera obscura. Light comes in and an image is projected on the retina, the back of the eye, uh, and that uh, information is taken to the visual cortex in the occipital lobe, you recall last time. One thing I didn't mention last time was that that retinal image is actually upside down on the back of the eye. This is just because of how optics work. And the brain has to uh, flip it uh, upside down so that we see the world uh, the right way, the right side up. But in any case, um, that's a very uh, loose task description of vision, to take uh, 2D information from the retina through the optic nerves into the early visual system and uh, construct a detailed, um, uh, a detailed 3D representation such that I understand the world is out there, it's stable, uh, these objects are all, uh, I can distinguish between these objects, uh, and it's not a big perceptual mess, right? That would seem to be a good task description, and that would require some kind of algorithm implemented in a physical medium. Of course, this is what Marr did for the early visual system. He gave an algorithmic account of how uh, the 2D sketch, as he called it, is transformed into a 2.5D sketch, which incorporates more uh, features, finally to a, uh, a full uh, 3D sketch, uh, which allows us to have this amazing visual representation that we seem to have. But is this the way it really works? Perhaps for the early visual system, something like this is indeed going on. But we learned last time that this uh, might also be a little bit of an oversimplification. We learned last time specifically that uh, the picture of perception and cognition, or rather the, the picture of perception, cognition, and action that we illustrated last time is actually uh, much more minimalist than we would be led to believe by taking Mars' top-down approach. And remember, his approach is top-down because it starts at a higher level of abstraction and, and gets more concrete as, it, as, uh, as we move down the levels. We saw, when we considered evidence for the four propositions that Clark outlined on uh, page 97, that uh, perception um, or perceptual systems don't build a detailed inner representation which is operated on by some kind of central cognition. Um, it could be the case that we use the world as its own best model, like Rodney Brooks uh, tries to do for his behavior-based robots. Um, then again, it's easy to go really extreme here, maybe a little too extreme. There's a theory of inactive perception where uh, perception is just all about certain sensory motor contingencies. Perception is something we actively do, not something we passively do. Uh, Clark is not suggesting something like this, which we get from thinkers like Alvin Noe or Kevin O'Regan. I don't think Clark is really going that far. Uh, and I don't mean to, I don't re really mean to try to adjudicate between either of these positions uh, here because I haven't really described an act of perception in uh, substantive enough detail to do that. Uh, but the idea is, uh, that's common to all of this, is using the world as its own representation rather than uh, creating some kind of uh, snapshot in the mind of the world. And we saw this last time with change blindness and inattentional blindness. Um, and as is the case with Herbert the can-collecting robot, uh, 
uh, we can make perceptual tasks easier, actions easier by exploiting um, bodily positions, other actions, uh, so on and so forth. So um, all of this is to say that the, uh, the uh, picture of perception that we've illustrated, excuse that almost pun, um, is, uh, is not something that undermines Mars levels of analysis. Um, again, Mars work here is very helpful. We just need to make sure that we don't lose sight of the implementational details because we're too heavily focused on information processing accounts. It's the same, uh, same risk we confront with functionalism. Functionalism is great. We need functional descriptions, but we also need to pay some attention to the implementational details. So none of this undermines completely what Marr is saying. And of course, as I've said repeatedly, Marr was well aware of the need to pay attention to the implementational details. One could even argue that he developed his tri-level hypothesis uh, and uh, gave descriptions at the level of task analysis and uh, at the level of the algorithm to aid his understanding of the implementational details. Uh, but the implementational details, uh, descriptions at the implementational level of analysis can also aid information processing descriptions. So uh, I guess the lesson here is that we shouldn't be exclusively top down in our approach. We could be also uh, taking a bottom up approach or perhaps a combined approach. So um, this doesn't undermine Mars levels, but it does bring a few things to light. It means uh, that identifying and studying the right information processing task requires an appreciation for the implementational details. Uh, that's pretty much what I just said. Um, and also we need to keep in mind that there are additional levels of functional organization in the brain. There is not one um, implementational level in the brain. And this is very important to keep in mind. Um, Shepard, a famous neuroscientist, uh, I think has identified uh, seven levels of functional organization in the brain. And here we're talking about um, very high levels of functional organization, uh, like what certain areas of the cortex are doing. So here we could be talking about Rodman's areas, or we could talk about different cortices, the different lobes, the frontal lobes versus the occipital versus the parietal and the temporal, right? Um, so these are very high level, uh, high levels of neural organization. But there are lower levels too. There are levels of cortical columns. There are levels uh, that are perhaps as small as groups of neurons. Perhaps uh, synapse, the level of the synapse is a level of organization, all the way down to the chemicals that help uh, regulate all of this, all of the ways that the synapses communicate with each other. These are, of course, neurotransmitters and neuromodulators. What's the best level to count as the implementational level? Well, it probably depends on uh, what you're trying to understand. Um, are you trying, what, 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 what is the computational task you're trying to understand? And um, how have you described it algorithmically? If you're trying to identify the implementational details, you need to keep that stuff in mind. But it also goes the other way, as I've been saying. Perhaps uh, if your uh, set of tools allows you to study a certain level of uh, implementational detail or organization, perhaps say uh, one neuroscientist is going to be interested in what's happening chemically in the synapses, while another is going to be interested in which large-scale brain areas are involved in what uh, cognitive tasks, um, that will dictate perhaps how you describe uh, the system at the algorithmic or the computational level. So it's got to go both ways because there's more than one level of implementation if we're talking levels of organization in the brain, not levels of analysis. There may also be other levels besides the three that Marr identifies. Um, uh, some scholars talk of an architectural level uh, in addition to an implementational level, uh, algorithmic level, and computational level. And the architectural level specifies what kind of cognitive architecture we're looking at. So I'm not going to go into uh, too much detail there, but if you want to check that out, you can check out the research of uh, Dawson. Uh, who has written a really great book called uh, Mind, Body, World, 
which you can download for free, by the way. And it's totally legal. It's not a it's not a pirated copy. He has made this book available in PDF form for free. So do check that out. Very good stuff. Also, something that ties into what I was just discussing about levels of organization in the brain concerns artificial neural networks and connectionism, which, of course, we talked about uh, in the two lectures previous to uh, these lectures on perception, action, and the brain. Remember that these artificial neural networks use distributed representations or subsymbolic representations and superpositional coding schemes. That means that... Uh, uh, the knowledge is not represented in a semantically transparent, neat, discrete way. There aren't discrete symbols that represent knowledge. Knowledge is distributed throughout the activation space of the network, and this is all superpositional, such that representation A will share a lot of the pa uh, patterns of activation uh, that uh, representation B has, uh, even though they represent two different things. So. Uh, this means that the distinction between knowledge store, internal representations, and algorithms gets a little blurry. Um, so even information processing uh, type descriptions, you know, computational and algorithmic level descriptions can get a little bit blurry when we consider these implementational details. And here's where the, the lines between Mars levels start to get a little bit fuzzy. So uh, I guess the point here is that if brains work this way as well, um, which sounds pretty plausible, I mean, artificial neural networks are supposed to be artificial models of how real groups of neurons work together. Uh, so if brains do work this way, then the idea of an algorithm acting on representations as a means of explaining what's going on in here uh, computationally might start to look, uh, to look a, a little bit untenable. Of course, some would disagree with this. I think Jerry Fodor uh, and Zenon Polition would argue that uh, neural networks are not really an alternative to symbol systems at all. They are just uh, pitched at an implementational uh, kind of level, whereas um, symbol systems are perhaps pitched at a more abstract level. And I've mentioned this before, and hopefully this level's talk from Mar. Uh, clarifies it. But if, if Fodor and Polition are right about that, then that means that neural networks aren't an alternative to symbol systems. They're just a, a, a way, a, a, an interesting way of implementing them. But algorithmically, they're doing, well, they're doing something that we can still describe algorithmically. Um, but not everyone agrees. Some people think, uh, some people think that actually this makes, um, this, this idea uh, or rather these features of neural networks, uh, you know, superpositional coding schemes, distributed or subsymbolic representations, blurs this distinction between implementation, representation, and algorithm, and that makes Mars ideas a little untenable. I don't really have a strong position either way, although I think that both perspectives are interesting. Um, so, um, whatever you think, I think Churchlin and Senyowski are probably right, and I'm paraphrasing them here, uh, they're probably right when they say that Mars levels of analysis um, and the brain's levels of organizations don't always align in a satisfying manner. And that's okay as long as we keep the kinds of things we've been discussing in this lecture so far in mind as we study these systems. Uh, and we don't take an exclusive top-down approach, but we take a sort of blended approach and we pay attention to where the lines between levels start to get blurry. All right, so let's consider the second point of discussion, which is all about building bigger brains. Artificial brains, of course. Um, here, Clark mentions briefly on page 108, uh, more biologically plausible artificial neural networks. Uh, I'm not gonna go into super detail here, but a lot of it concerns the research of um, Chris Eliasmith, uh, who is a professor at the University of Waterloo, uh, in fact, here in Ontario. Um, he and his colleagues have built a much bigger, more biologically plausible artificial brains. Um, and this is all thanks to advances in computing power. You know, in the 1980s, uh, the so-called turn to the brain, we had interesting findings from neuroscience. We had the backpropagation algorithm finally. We could start doing interesting things with multi-layer neural networks. But now, thanks to the sheer computing power that's available to us, uh, 
we can do uh, much more interesting research. But the important thing here is, oh, my dog is barking. What are you barking at? What are you barking at, eh? What are you barking at? You should be, I'm filming a lecture, you must be quiet. Uh, what was I saying? All oh, right, sheer scale alone, uh, however, oh, bye. So just making a whole bunch of artificial neurons and stringing together uh, all of these neurons, though, that's not going to get us to a better understanding of how neural systems operate. We need to put them together in biologically plausible ways. And uh, Chris Eliasmith and his colleagues have done this with the various projects that are described on page 108. Uh, the most interesting of which to me is Spawn, which um, has uh, biologically plausible uh, artificial neurons, but also uh, sensors and effectors so that it can um, do things in this artificial environment, a virtual environment. And we can get it to do all kinds of interesting uh, cognitive tasks, like the Stroop task, for example. And it will, um, well, make similar mistakes to the mistakes people make when they're doing these tasks. So that's very interesting. Uh, but the point here is, is that we need to make sure that the models that we're building... Um, the point here is that uh, the, when we make these models, uh, we need to make sure that the models have the right means of interacting with uh, their environments in the right kinds of ways. That's what Spawn is all about. We need to make sure they have the right uh, bodily forms, even if that's a virtual body, um, for, doing, uh, for doing what we want them to do. So this idea of biological plausibility, comp uh, increased computing power, uh, but also paying attention to how the uh, agent interacts with the environment is key. So um, we need to pay attention to the implementational details in addition to the other uh, levels, as I've said many times, but also to the brain-mind world interface as well, if you like. Let's move on to the next point of discussion, which is all about computation and implementation. So, of course, human designers keep the computational and implementational levels of analysis separate, right? But, as we saw in the last lecture, um, human designers uh, design things consciously, perhaps in a step-by-step -step manner, and they, they build things to serve a purpose. Human design, for lack of a better term, intelligent design, even though I really don't like that term, is teleological. It aims at some end or purpose or goal. So our designs result in systems and certain des design strategies that are neatly decomposable, teleological, and so on and so forth, right? That's what human designers do, like an engineer or a computer scientist. But remember, evolution doesn't work this way. Evolution is more like a tinkerer in that it has to tinker with what's already there, make changes to it, build upon it, not design things from scratch. And we saw this uh, example with the human lung, which um, if you go back far enough into our evolutionary past, evolved from the swim bladder of these lobe-finned fish that started crawling out of the oceans millions and millions of years ago. So, um... Biological uh, evolution is incremental in a sense. It's step-by-step step in a sense in that small changes accrue in each generation such that uh, eventually you get all kinds of interesting different species with all kinds of interesting different things like swim bladders and lungs and hands that grasp or can move fingers individually. Um, but uh, it's not neatly functionally decomposable like uh, human design is. Um, you can depose it, uh, decompose it to a certain extent, but it's not neat, right? You can um, do some functional decomposition when it comes to the human brain, right? You can look at different areas of, uh, you know, different cytoarchitectural areas like Broadman's areas or what different parts of the brain are doing. Uh, but they're all connected together and work in a parallel uh, way uh, that's really kind of messy, right? Um, if you were to build a human-like robot with human-like intelligence and consciousness... Not that we can do that at this point, but if you were to do it, you would probably make their robot brain much less messy than our messy, naturally evolved brains. That's the point I'm trying to make. So, as we saw last time, 
evolution does explore these design spaces, uh, which might seem a little opaque uh, to a human engineer. And evolution can uncover solutions to problems that depend on complex interactions uh, between the agent and the environment, or uh, aspects of the environment, or what have you. Are there ways around this mismatch, though? Um, yes, yes, it turns out there are. One of the ways we might get around this uh, is to uh, try and adapt some of the strategies that we find in natural biological evolution when it comes to the design of artificial cognitive systems. And this is what John Holland uh, had done in, I believe it was the late 1970s, when he conceived of genetic algorithms. Genetic algorithms sound really cool, and they are really cool. Uh, you remember John Holland, I mentioned uh, very briefly in a previous lecture that he has known for uh, the game of life. Uh, he's also known for genetic algorithms. Algorithms that work a bit like genetic code. Um, information is represented that in them, and it, uh, certain uh, bits of information can be inherited uh, in subsequent iterations. Uh, there can be mutations. Uh, basically, it's an algorithm that mimics evolution, right? And we can use these genetic algorithms to train populations of real electronic circuits. And you can read about this in Chapter 5 of Clark. I'm not going to go into uh, too much detail here, but they have trained robots to walk this way using populations of circuits um, uh, that are controlled by this genetic algorithm that uses, uh, you know, uh, the performance of the robot to try and do a little bit better every time, every generation of instructions for the robot. And these robots proceed from just kind of moving randomly to uh, kind of crawling, shuffling, maybe like a baby, all the way to walking. And it's very fascinating stuff. So, uh, again, I'm not going to go into super detail here. If you want to read more about genetic algorithms, uh, take a look at box 5.3 in Clark, and uh, feel free to read a little bit more about the examples. There is one walking robot that used flip-flops, I believe, and another robotic puppy that is described in the chapter, um, and each of these were trained using these genetic algorithms. Now, I don't want to labor too long on this next point of discussion, but we're coming back to change blindness and inattentional blindness again. Uh, last time I discussed the idea that change blindness and inattentional blindness are uh, pretty compelling pieces of evidence that we don't actually maintain a rich, detailed inner model of the environment that is then operated on by some kind of central processor. Uh, but before we can make that claim stick, uh, there's a little work that needs to be done. We need to show, or rather we need to rule a few things out. We need to rule out whether these inner representations are in fact created, but uh, maybe they just decay really quickly or are overwritten such that we can't use them to detect changes uh, that happen when our eyes saccade, right? That's something that needs to be ruled out. Something else that needs to be ruled out. One possibility is that representations of uh, the pre-change, uh, you know, representation of what things look like before the change exist, but aren't used for change detection. They're tucked away in, I don't know, some neural memory bank and they just aren't getting used. That's another possibility. Or maybe the representations exist, but they exist in a format that can't be used for change detection. That's another possibility. And finally, it may be the case that uh, there is a pre-change and post-change representation. There is a detailed representation of how the world looked uh, before my eyes saccade and a change is made and after the change is made. Maybe those are uh, two pictures that do exist in the head in some richly detailed way, but maybe this comparison operation is just never performed uh, because unless the change is really, really salient, it might be a waste of computational resources. So, these are all possibilities we need to be attuned to. Uh, and again, I direct you towards the relevant parts of this chapter uh, for exploring this a little bit further, if you'd like. Uh, for now, 
I want to move on to the last point of discussion. So if you want to uh, read more about the change spotting stuff, look at point of discussion D. Now we're going to move on to E, the fifth point of discussion, and talk about internal fragmentation and coordinated action. So the picture of neural processing that has been sketched by Clark in this chapter and in the previous chapter is, as we've seen, very different from the traditional picture, which is inspired heavily by classic symbolic AI. Um, it's beginning to look more and more like the brain with all of its multiple streams of processing running in parallel and its action-oriented representations is more like what V.S. Ramachandran calls a bag of tricks, right? And this is, this is not an endorsement of, of something like massive modularity, uh, necessarily, but um, it, it, it is to say that there might be specialized mechanisms that work in concert with one another. Uh, and we saw this last time with uh, the example of reaching out and grasping a coffee cup. There are two different visual streams, one conscious that has to do with um, representing the world and help me identify objects so I can identify this as a, con uh, as a coffee cup, and another stream that is unconscious and used for uh, finding out where things are in space and grasping them. So there's two systems working in concert when I reach out and pick up the coffee cup and take a sip from it. Very complicated stuff. So the picture, basically, is that intelligence doesn't seem to depend on some unitary information, uh, like some kind of a universal code of the mind, like a language of thought, being operated on by a central processing unit or central cognition. Rather, intelligence seems to rely on this bag of tricks that we've evolved, which support um, the needs of certain kinds of creatures like us, or monkeys, or ducks, or all the way down to insects, right? That ex uh, support the needs of these creatures in certain environmental niches. Um, so, um, if the mind is fragmentary in this way, how does this large-scale coherent behavior emerge? Well, there could be many different, uh, many different answers here. One answer uh, is internal signaling. Another is perhaps uh, that it's due to global dissipative effects. Or perhaps it's due to external influence. So let's just run through these quickly. And by the way, I'm spending more time on this stuff because I feel that it really gets us to that... Um, mind, body, and world interface that Clark is so interested in focusing in on. So are there informationally rich messages in some kind of general purpose code like uh, mentalese or the language of thought? Maybe not. One thing that we need, uh, or one possibility that we need to remain attuned to is that um, there are simple signals that uh, might simply uh, elicit more activity or inhibit activity. So something like the subsumption architecture that I discussed in the previous lecture, perhaps brains have evolved some kind of subsumption architecture where uh, when one condition is satisfied, another module kind of takes over and uh, does the next step. That's what the internal signaling possibility is all about. Another possibility is, of course, global dissipative effects. Uh, here we might have uh, something like gating mechanisms or switching posts, or perhaps more plausibly, certain substance, uh, substances, chemical substances in minds, real minds, real brains, uh, that uh, affect how information processing happens. So here we're talking about neurotransmitters and neuromodulators. They spread throughout the system, they have their effect, and then they dissipate, and then activity in the system returns to normal functioning, right? So now these substances in real brains are real chemicals, real neurotransmitters, but in artificial brains, uh, well, perhaps they could be virtual. So uh, I, I brought this up in a previous class. If we uh, one day create uh, conscious robots, uh, when the robots do mind-altering drugs, would those be virtual drugs? Uh, that work on their virtual brains in the same way that uh, chemicals like caffeine work on uh, the synaptic connections in human brains. Maybe they will. Time will tell. Someone's going to have to invent the right kind of robot before we can find out. 
We could also take advantage of uh, temporal coding strategies, uh, like those that we talked about uh, in the lectures for the previous chapter. Temporal coding strategies, uh, you know, like recurrent loops, make neural networks able to uh, cope with um, a dynamic uh, temporally sequenced events. Uh, so that could be another way uh, in which we could achieve these uh, global dissipative effects. And the final point is this idea that perhaps um, this coordinated uh, action arises because of external influences, influences from the environment. So maybe the um, action of the external environment can influence internal processing in, in some way. Uh, and we saw this with Herbert the robot, right? If you want to go back and review uh, the video that I linked you to of Herbert the can collecting robot, a lot of his behaviors depended on what was going on in the environment. You know, Herbert would just keep exploring until it found an obstacle that might be a table. Then it would stop and scan the surface of the table. It's not like Herbert was act actively looking for tables. Herbert was just wandering around, and when it encountered something table-like, um, its wandering behavior was subsumed by its table-scanning behavior. And if it identifies a can, it moves in front of the can and aligns itself in the right kind of way, and it can reach out with its arm and grab the can. So um, maybe, like Herbert, a lot of our cognition depends upon external uh, environmental cues in such a way that um, with the right kind of cues, we get this coordinated action, even though the mind is like perhaps a bag of tricks and not a global, unified, uh, central processor working on this language of thought uh, kind of thing. So yeah, that's possible that our cognition is supported in a way that's um, much more similar to uh, a new robot or a behavior-based robot like Herbert uh, rather than a classic symbol system. So uh, just keep that in mind as we proceed throughout the remainder of this class. All right, everyone, so that is it. Um, geez, I, I told you this one would be shorter, and I was actually right about it. So today we've examined the points of discussion in Chapter 5 from Clark. Uh, I've examined some of them in more detail than others, so I urge you to return to the textbook if you're not sure about anything, and also send me a message via email or Discord if you're not sure of anything that I've covered. I have left some details out. Um, part of that is in the interest of time and my continued efforts to catch up, and part of that is so that you can also go looking for interesting things to talk about from the textbook for your critical responses. So. Um, again, if you're not sure about anything, uh, just let me know. Uh, but don't be afraid to dive in and, and try and tackle some of this stuff in a critical response, if you like, on your own.